Well, we are going to move on to another vision of utopia, a utopia where people actually care about the planet. I know, controversial, and yet here we are debating it in 2019. Um, we've got an amazing lineup of people to talk about this. I'm really thrilled to introduce them to the stage. Um, we've got Tessa Khan, who is an international human rights lawyer and a climate change lawyer. Um, come on stage, Tessa. And if you think that litigating... <laughs> If you think that litigating on behalf of the environment sounds kind of strange and crazy, well, let me tell you, it does exist and it is very, very cool. And we have Mary Robinson, who is, as some of you may know, the former president of Ireland. She may be the first politician and former president we've had at MIF. And we've also decided to come coordinating for the panel topic, which is really good. <laughs> Didn't arrange that at all. Um, and she's also a former United Nations Commission, High Commissioner for Human Rights. And they were both, well, Mary hosts a podcast called Mothers of Invention, which is all about feminist solutions to a man-made crisis, the man-made crisis being climate change. And Tessa was her inaugural guest on episode one. So we are very much hosting a reunion of two minds. So I wanted to start by asking the both of you, how did you kind of get to this point of being involved in climate justice and, and what does that term even mean for people who aren't aware of it? Well, I was involved, oh, sorry. I was involved in climate justice for a long time, uh, probably from about 2004 on, but I'm new to podcasts. Uh, when I was uh, asked whether I would consider a podcast, I had to ask the stupid question, what's a podcast, you know, because so, I'm an elder. But um, luckily, uh, Tessa's much more polished and she was a very good, but uh, climate justice is about the injustice of climate change, that it affects the poorest countries and the poorest communities disproportionately and they're not responsible. And now we have a different uh, insight into injustice, which I'm so pleased about, the school children. You know, starting with Greta Thunberg in Sweden, and now school ch children, basically all over the developed world in particular, coming out of school Fridays for future. And what they're saying is, you're not protecting us, you're not protecting our future. We've been looking at you know, what is available, and we see that we don't have a guaranteed future. It is unfair, it is unjust, do something. You have time to do it, do something. And that's the injustice of climate change. Right, what does climate justice mean to you? Um, well, I think it's, you know, exactly as Mary described, it's about the many dimensions in which climate change is a fundamentally unjust phenomenon. And um, the way that it really, I guess, resonates with me on a personal level is that um, my family is from Bangladesh, um, and I grew up for the most part in Australia. Um, and Bangladesh is one of the poorest countries in the world, and Australia is one of the richest countries. Um, and I now live here in the UK. And climate change is affecting Bangladesh in ways right now that are um, devastating. It's causing many hundreds of thousands of people to immigrate from their homes um, because of sea level rise and extreme weather events. And your average Bangladeshi has a carbon footprint that is one thirty-third the the size of the average British person's carbon footprint, and yet they're feeling the effects of climate change um, right now and much more severely than anyone here is. And I think, you know, that's not to in any way diminish the engagement with climate change as an issue in this part of the world and the very real anxiety and grief that people feel as a result of climate change. And, you know, people do talk about climate grief um, here as a way of describing um, the, the loss of ecosystems and the fact that we're sort of leaving behind a world that we knew and, and moving into something much more uncertain. But um, I guess when you talk about climate grief in Bangladesh, there was a recent study that showed that um, women in areas where salt water is starting, starting to intrude into the drinking water supply are um, miscarrying at a rate that's much greater than usual. And that's climate grief. Um, in Bangladesh. So, you know, you can really, it's a way of appreciating the, the depth of injustice, I think, between one part of the world and, and the other. And how did you come to be a climate change lawyer? So I was working as a human rights lawyer and advocate, um, and I was living in Asia, and it was just becoming increasingly 
clear to me that climate change is the greatest systemic threat that we face um, to the enjoyment of our human rights globally. Um, it's a threat to our rights to food, health, housing, water, sanitation. Um, but it also is actually a threat to our civil and political rights. And part of the reason for that is that climate change is anticipated to drive um, 120 million additional people into poverty by the year 2030. And as we know, as the world becomes more unequal, um, it corrodes our democracies and the rule of law. And we're starting to enter into, a, I think, a time when governments will increasingly invoke um, the idea of climate change to um, actually introduce more nationalistic or authoritarian regimes. And I think that's something we have to guard against as well. So it's a really systemic threat, I would say, to human rights. Mary, how did your time in government influence the way you see climate justice? It didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, was president from 1990 to 1997, never really focused on climate change, then became High Commissioner for Human Rights from 1997 to 2002, never really focused on climate change because another part of the UN was dealing with it. I was in my silo giving leadership on human rights, gender equality, rights of indigenous peoples, rights of people with disabilities, you know, a big portfolio. but. Somewhere else, they were dealing with climate. I didn't make the connection. It was when I started working in African countries on economic and social rights. Really, really important rights if you don't have them. Rights to food, health, water, and you know, women, peace, and security issues. And everywhere I went, people kept saying to me, things are so much worse. Is God punishing us? And when I looked into it, it was the, just the complete unpredictability of the climate impacts, the climate disruption that was happening which was completely outside their experience. And their experience would go back 200 years in a village. So they knew what they were talking about, and this was just completely different. And they didn't know when to sow, they didn't know when to harvest, etc. And I was honorary president of Oxfam at the time, and I was traveling you know, in different parts of Africa. And then I went to my first climate summit, um, which was Copenhagen in 2009. And I was completely devastated by the fact that all the conversation was technical and scientific, but mainly technical. Nothing to do with human rights, gender, the gender dimensions of climate change, which are so evident because of the different impacts on men and women, because of their different social roles, etc. Uh, and so I decided to have a foundation to deal with climate justice and make this my human rights issue, which it will continue for so long as I have energy. And that's the Mary Robinson Foundation? Yes, on climate justice. And when you, was there something that particularly sticks out for you when you talk about traveling through Africa and seeing firsthand how people were witnessing what climate change was doing to their communities? Was there a particular incident or encounter that really sticks out for you? There was actually. Uh, I had become an elder, one of the elders that Nelson Mandela had brought together. And uh, Archbishop Tutu was our chair. And Oxfam asked Archbishop Tutu and myself to be a kind of, um, how would I say, almost a jury of five farmers who were going to tell how climate was affecting them. And be, you know, this was evidence they were gathering for the Copenhagen summit. And I remember sitting in South Africa with Archbishop Tutu and listening to these five African farmers. Four of them were women, which was not unusual. Uh, the, the only man was from Kenya. He was a pastoralist. He'd gone down from a herd of 200 um, goats to only 20. And you know, you got the impression, if things continue with this drought, I won't even have 20 at the end of the year. It was that kind of sadness. And then we had a woman from Mali, a woman from Malawi, um, a woman from South, a, a, um, a, a Roy Bosch um, woman, and her husband was there too, from South Africa. Um, she was a Roy Bosch tea producer. I'm sure some of you know the Roybosch tea. And um, the drought had totally destroyed her harvest. And uh, the last one, and the most impressive from my point of view, was Constance O'Kellett from Uganda, because I got to know Constance very well afterwards. And I remember, you know, th they were telling these sad stories. And Archbishop Tutu um, had been very, you know, upbeat when he met them, first of all, you know, greeted them warmly and was full of jokes and things as he always is. But as he kept hearing these stories, he kind of slumped in his chair. And I s decided to say, well, look, I come from the west of Ireland. My father was a medical doctor. 
And I used to go out with him. I was the only girl among these four brothers. And um, we would go out into the countryside because he, you know, long calls to visit um, homes of very poor patients. And he, he loved the farming community. But he would say to me, Mary, the one thing about farmers is they always complain about the weather. Always, always. So I decided to lighten up this conversation. And I said to these five farmers in front of me, you know, farmers always complain about the weather. Is that, is that what you're doing? And I remember Constance, she stood up, and she's a tall woman. And she said, with great dignity, she said, this is outside our experience. And I'll never forget her saying that. It actually you know, struck me, about, and I went and found out more about Constance. And she's the first story in a book that I've written called Climate Justice, Hope, Resilience, and the Fight for a Sustainable Future that Bloomsburg have published. There are 11 stories. Nine of them involve women, but they're also two good men. Um, and th there are stories of people who are coping with what they're not responsible for, which is the way I'm trying to get the empathy and the understanding of just the injustice of it. And it also takes a lot to depress um, the bishop, uh, Archbishop of Tutu, it? It does. cheered it? up afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of wanted to talk about uh, what you do, Tessa, which is climate litigation, which sounds very you know, high-minded and complicated, but what does it actually mean? What does it actually involve? Um, so I guess in its simplest terms, it involves holding the institutions that are responsible for climate change accountable for what they've done. Um, and there are two sets of institutions that bear primary responsibility for the crisis that we're in right now. The first is the fossil fuel industry, which has known about the problem since at least the 1960s. Um, it has actively used its resources to obfuscate the facts around climate science that its own researchers and scientists were confirming, and it's obviously continued to sell and profit in the order of billions of dollars from the sale of a product that it knew um, was harming the future of humanity. So that's one uh, actor. The other one is national governments, um, who have also known about the problem since at least the 1970s, but unlike the fossil fuel industry, have been actively committing to do something about the problem since 1993, when they've not 197 governments ratified the first treaty um, on climate change, and they committed to stabilizing um, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Since they uh, ratified that treaty in 1993, and annually have come together to renew that commitment in more decisions and more treaties, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has increased to the point where the concentration of carbon dioxide is now the highest that it's been in three million years um, and basically is unprecedented in modern human history. So people are pretty angry about that, um, about the flagrant failure of governments to fulfill the promises that they've been making for decades now. Um, and litigation is one way, it's probably the most aggressive way, I would say, of, um, of asserting our rights um, to be protected from the foreseeable harm that climate change is, is wreaking um, and to really instill some responsibility on the part of governments to take action to do what's necessary now. And there's one case that you've been involved in. Tell us about that, the Dutch case. Sure, yeah, so maybe to make it a little bit more concrete. So in um, 2013, my colleagues um, sued the Dutch government um, for climate change, basically for the fact that the Dutch government's commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions was totally inadequate compared to the, tra the trajectory that we need to be on to stay you know, within safe boundaries. Um, and in 2015, a Dutch court found for the first time in the world um, that the government did have to reduce the country's net amount of greenhouse gas emissions by a significant percentage by 2020. Um, and then that decision was appealed, but we won again on appeal last year and I now um, support citizens and organizations and individuals around the world who want to basically do the same thing in their own country um, because it's an incredibly empowering thing to do at a time when I think a lot of us feel like we've been stripped of our power in this crisis. And I remember being the UN Secretary General's special envoy on climate change when that judgment came out. And it really, whoo, my goodness. Changed the game. The country's been sued and, won, you know, they won in court and they won on appeal more, more recently. And it, it really did make a difference. It, it, you know, it kind of, you know, it, I think it helped even 
possibly to get the decision we got in the Paris Agreement. And I think one of the great things about your episode with Tessa on Mothers of Invention, which is fantastic and you should all listen to it. Um, personally, I felt very motivated to do things after listening to Mothers of Invention because its entire thing is women hold the key to solving climate change, which of course is a very empowering thing to hear if you're a woman yourself. Um, one of the big things that came out of that episode was that the plaintiffs who sued the government could just be anyone. You know, in some cases they were literally people in high school and farmers. So if I'm interpreting it correctly, so are you saying that basically anybody in this room could essentially sue the UK government, that you could build a case against your own government to take them to court for not taking care of climate change? In short, yes. Ex yeah, they could. <laughs> <laughs> Except, you know, it, 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 you know, it's something unusual for me to have to say as an Irish person, but the United Kingdom is quite good on climate. <laughs> But not good enough, not good I would enough. say, Mary. Not good so, enough. Yeah. But actually put a stake in the ground recently sure. and legislated for zero emissions by 2050. Probably not doing enough to make that realistic yet. But still, I have to acknowledge, my country has a plan, but a plan is different from actually making it legislation. You know, so, you know, for once, for once I have to acknowledge, uh, you know, <laughs> really sticks just in the be cross. <laughs> So if the UK, for instance, doesn't reach that target, could people then start to sue? I'm very attached to this idea of suing the government, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, we should hold governments accountable every step of the way, you know, because they are really good at responding in moments of peak public pressure um, by passing a piece of legislation that kind of responds to the demands broadly that are being made, but often doesn't set out in very concrete terms how we're going to get there. And I think that the declaration of a climate emergency in a country is a fantastic description of the problem, but we don't know yet how we're going to solve the problem. And that's what we need to hold governments accountable for now. So for some context, the UK recently declared a climate emergency, which is one of the demands uh, made by Extinction Rebellion, the climate change movement. Um, but of course, as you put it, we're not quite sure on, you know, now we've declared a climate emergency, what's next? But maybe I could uh, really flesh out why it's right that we talk about a climate emergency. Um, and I, I wanted to go back to 2015 because I had a, this privilege of being the special envoy of the Secretary General and I was kind of a, um, a close observer of the two frameworks that were being negotiated in that year. And the first one was in September 2015, the negotiation of the 2030 Agenda with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And I wear this badge, partly because it's the only badge the UN has ever produced that I like, but also <laughs> it signifies. And um, the reason that we got that agenda, you know, it was a negotiation between 193 countries. It was slightly messy, but in the end, the package was good. And it was good because it was voluntary. Countries said to themselves, we can pick and choose what we want to do. And then we went forward to the climate agreement in December of that year, in 2015, and I was very focused because that was my job. And it was a treaty, but it became weaker as we got closer to it. And there was less of a, a, any kind of a shall and more you know, aspirational. But the small island states kept pleading, and in particular, Tony de Brum, the foreign minister of the Marshall Islands, was very effective at all these ministerial and informal ministerial meetings, which were very boring, actually, because governments kept repeating their lines. But he kept saying, do you want my country to go under? Do you want us to no longer be a sovereign people? Do you really want us no longer to have a future? Is that what you want? And it kind of got into the ear and that's why we got a goal in the Paris Climate Agreement of staying well below two degrees Celsius of warming and needing to work towards 1.5 degrees. And that needing to work towards 1.5 degrees, I thought, and I think we all thought at that time, was for the small island states. It was a kind of sop to the small island states. But it had never been studied. The scientists of the world had never studied exactly what that meant. So the Paris Climate Agreement asked the scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, more than a thousand scientists who come together to study. And last October, as I think a number of you will know, the scientists issued their report. And it is stark, it's a wake-up call. Because what they said is, there is a big difference 
between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, because in that gap of 1.5 to 2 degrees, bad things happen. The coral reefs more or less disappear. The Arctic ice more or less disappears. And there's a big melt of the permafrost, which not only sends up carbon emissions, but also methane, which is far, far more dangerous. And therefore, the scientists recommended that we stay at 1.5 degrees for the whole world. And they said, this is doable. It will require political will. What we need to do immediately is get on course to reduce by 45% our, our carbon emissions before 2030. Reduce by 45% before 2030. In 2018, carbon emissions went up. This year, they're going to go up again because we're not changing. And this is where we are. Uh, we're in this strange thing where we now know that we have a gap of the, the scientists last uh, October said 12 years. It's actually now 11 years and we're in July. Time is of the essence. And that's what Greta Thunberg is saying. That's what the school children are saying. That's what Extinction Rebellion is saying. That's what the young people are saying. That's what women leaders are increasingly saying. That's what a lot of businesses are saying. Can we join the dots and get a movement going that will actually force governments to take their responsibility and um, switch from the um, subsidies for fossil fuel, put a proper price on carbon, do all the things that we need to do in order to have a safe world. It's as serious as that. Why do you think there's been so much resistance to course correcting? Because I feel like if you'd went around and told every single politician in the world, there's a meteor about to hit the world in 11 years, hmm. and we've got 11 years to build something to fix it and make sure we don't all die, they would immediately get started on fixing things. But because it's climate change for some reason, people just aren't kind of hopping to it with the kind of urgency you'd think they'd need? Well, I'll, I'll answer. I don't want to monopolize this with, with Tessa. But um, I, I think I have two thoughts about that. Um, we need to remember that we had an earlier alarm, and we've responded. In 1985, we realized that the ozone layer was opening a big hole in the ozone layer. And the countries of the world came together, and we got a binding treaty eliminating the um, gases, the, the, the refrigerator stuff that was doing that. And it happened very quickly. And in fact, China has been cheating a bit on that, if I could put it that way, recently. And we're monitoring it. And we've found them. And you know, they're, they're, they're being pinned to their responsibility for that. So we did it then. Um, this is more complicated. And I've learned recently, funnily enough, I learned it in the Vatican about less than three weeks ago. I was at a conference, uh, the second convening that Cardinal Turkson had done on behalf of Pope Francis of the heads of oil and gas companies and the heads of um, finance companies together. Um, I was, wasn't at the first one, but I was very pleased to be at this one. And they were all there, ExxonMobil, Total, BP, Shell, all of them CEOs, head, head guys, and the heads of the finance companies. And what I actually learned was that the profits from fossil fuel are so much, so much greater than the profits. And there are profits to be made from renewable energy. You can make profits. And there are a lot of people working on renewable energy now. But you're kind of, it's you know, big profits up there. And so the heads of these companies have their shareholders, have their stakeholders, have their, and they're just, they just don't want to move. They just don't want to move. Now, at that meeting, we got a, a, a discussion about just transition, which is about the workers in oil, gas, and coal. Um, you know, there weren't coal people there. It was oil and gas. But the just transition um, was a discussion. We didn't have a statement on it. But they actually signed up to a statement on carbon pricing and on climate risk reduction because the Pope had such a hold on them. I don't understand it, but he had a moral clutch on them, and they were determined that they were going to do that and be seen to be doing that, at least. But I went away saying to myself, this is going to be a tough. You know, we need all the litigation. We need all the movement. We need everything we can possibly do because we're not on course for a safe world, okay. and it's going to be tough. Tessa, I saw you nodding when Mary described things as very complicated. Um, well, in a way, I think it's... 
It's actually quite simple, which is that there are some institutions who are benefiting tremendously from the system as it stands now, and they're the ones who are insulated from the impacts of climate change, and so they don't have an incentive to move at all in the short term. And whether that's politicians in northern, you know, developed countries who are only thinking about their election cycle and what they have to do to win the next election, or if it's fossil fuel industry executives who feel like they can get away with signing a pledge. I mean, I'm not downplaying the, um, you know, the importance of that particular pledge, but at the same time... It was a weak pledge, but the signatures were important. Okay, that's, yeah, I mean, great if they've signed it, but Shell and BP also just released plans to increase their oil and gas production by 120%, and they claim that that's compliant with the Paris Agreement, and we, we also know within the last week from new research that's been published that if we're going to stay below 1.5 degrees of warming, we literally cannot have a single new piece of fossil fuel infrastructure. So you just can't square that circle. Um, it's not possible for the fossil fuel industry to do anything other than go into managed decline that involves a just transition for its workers and accept that there is no future um, for that industry. But of course, it's currently one of the wealthiest and most powerful industries that, you know, in some countries um, have incredibly close relationships to governments and other political elites. So that's why this is really, I think, the fight of our lives. Hmm. So. I was wondering if you guys had any kind of tips, I guess, for what people here could do because, you know, unless you work in the fossil fuel industry and you're trying to destroy it from the inside, I really hope there's a Shell executive here <laughs> who's feeling like the sway of God, <laughs> the Pope approves. Um, so what can normal everyday people do to kind of make sure that, you know, the fossil fuel industry just doesn't get away with it, that we can keep climate change at bay? I think it's an important question, and what I've worked out in my own mind, and what I like to say to any audience now that I'm talking to, any captive audience, and you're a captive audience, just for the next few minutes, um, three things, three steps, and they are linked, and I think they will help. The first step is everyone, every single one of us, has to make climate change personal in our lives, and do something to show that we actually mean it. And that means reducing your own carbon footprint in some way, reducing your own demand in some way, reducing, you know, and I've become a pescatarian, I've given up meat. Small thing, others have gone much further, vegetarian, vegan, etc. I actually pine for a lamb from the west of Ireland, I have to say, you know, so it does cost me a little bit. And um, then you, when you've done that, you kind of take ownership. I've done my bit. And then the second step is to get angry and get active. Get angry with those who have much more responsibility and who are not taking it. And that's governments at every level, because they're only concerned about the next election, and they're not thinking. It's not even long term. It's relatively short term, and it's serious. Um, it's cities, but it's also the fossil fuel industry, agribusiness, transport, and all of that. And then get active is support those who are on the right side of this, all the organizations that are trying, all those who are trying to bring clean energy. All the, there, if you Google, there are so many things you can support now um, um, on the right side of this. And the third step, and I actually believe this is the most important, and I only came to it late. I believe we have to hurry and imagine this world that we need to rush towards. Um, imagine, because it's going to be a much healthier world, we won't have the fuels of fossil fuel, the fumes of fossil fuel that pollute air and water. Uh, we won't, we, we'll have to have a much fairer world because we'll have had to get clean energy to the billion people who never switch the switch for electricity at the moment and the 2.3 billion who still cook on dirty cook stoves. And therefore, it'll be a much fairer world. And let me just tell you briefly, I saw that world. I had the privilege of seeing it last November because I was invited to go to Venice for the closing of the architectural Biennale. Now, I actually, I'm not very familiar with Biennales. I've become more familiar now with all that. But it was being curated by two Irish architects who are actually friends of mine in Dublin. They're Grafton architects is how they promote themselves. They're brilliant. And they've done wonderful buildings around the world. 
They're very down-to-earth women, very ordinary women, Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara. And I walked through this huge expanse of space in Venice where they had invited architects to respond to their theme. And you know what the theme was? The Earth as our client. So they had decided to have the Earth as their client as architects and to ask um, architects from around the world to respond to that. And it was brilliant because I saw circular economy. I saw not just electric vehicles, but electric mobile, you know, m m many people being on these vehicles, you know, these um, moving people. Um, I saw all kinds of extraordinary things. One was saris from Bangladesh, Bangladesh, your country, um, that had been discarded by poor women, but there was enough material there to bring it back to high fashion. And it was being, you know, uh, you know redone, as, as a, repurposed as high fashion, which was fascinating. There was a Chinese architect with acupuncture architect, uh, architecture in very poor villages, remote villages in China, seven villages that she was working in. And the acupuncture was, you go into the village and you sit and you listen, and you hear what, would, what is it that would change life in that village? And the one that I can remember, but, uh, you know, I can half remember some of the other story, but there was a river going through one village and the, the bridge across the village had broken down. Now, it's, it's kind of easy for architects to fix a bridge, I presume, but that wasn't what happened. They listened and they discovered that if the bridge could be redone with a covered part in the middle, so that people could meet and talk and exchange and um, you know, uh, uh, trade, literally, um, that would make a huge difference. And that was the acupuncture architecture. So, you know, if we're going to get to where we need to get to, we, we shouldn't be thinking, we'll have to give up this, we'll have to give up that, we'll have to, yes, we'll have to, we, what we will have to give up is the throwaway society. Um, we're already doing it with plastics. Um, I'm very glad I don't see any single plastics in this room, thank goodness. Um, we're getting rid of what's harming us. Um, we, we need to have less waste we, less food waste. We need slow fashion, slow cooking, um, all of these things that are beginning to happen, but we need to embrace them in a, in a really, really um, enthusiastic way and say, this is the world we want. We want this better relationship world where the world will leave no one behind and do what the 2030 Agenda said. Sorry. I just get excited when I think about that world. <laughs> no, excitement is good. It's, excitement is better than despair, I was fine. Tessa, what kind of tips do you have for people who are looking to go away from this and implement some change in their lives? Um, so I would just add, I mean, I would echo everything that, that Mary has said. And I would say that in addition to getting active, I would encourage people to get political um, because the politics is what is going to actually fundamentally win this problem. Um, the economics is there, you know, solar and wind are either cheaper than or cost competitive to fossil fuel based sources of power. The technology is there. We now have lithium battery storage that will do what it needs to do for us to run our electricity networks. Um, and the one thing that we now need to shift is the political will to actually transition to the beautiful world that Mary's been describing. So I would encourage everyone here to reclaim the power that you have to bring that world about which you know can be everything from of course voting which is critical but writing to your MP right now joining the groups in your communities um, and cities that work on climate change talking to your friends about it talking to your kids about it you know just getting fired up about the fact that this is the defining issue of our lifetimes and every lifetime that comes after us um, and that it's ultimately about us reclaiming the power that has been concentrated in the hands of people who aren't interested in our future. So we have to take that power back and turn the world into the, the one that we know is possible. So I think... <laughs> And I, I was actually very pleased to see that OPEC, that fixes oil prices in the world, has now seen the school children as the biggest threat. And Greta Thunberg has tweeted back, that's the best news I've had all day. <laughs> so. So, so I think we've got some time for a couple of questions from the audience. If you could just raise your hand. It's a guy with a fantastic shirt in the front. Thank you. Um, 
we talk a lot about um, uh, industry versus people, I guess, which really is capitalism versus us. But capitalism is also people. And I wonder, what do you think is going on in the minds of these captains of industry and politicians? Do you think they really are in denial about climate change? Or do you think they re that they cannot perceive a future? I mean, what's going on with these people as individuals that we might, as individuals, be able to confront? Well, I do have a link with a group of companies um, that are urgently addressing this issue. Um, it's called the B Team of Business Leaders that's linked to the number of companies that have come to climate conferences in recent years. These are non-fossil fuel companies. They're companies and the CEOs have planned ahead 20 years and they don't like what they see for the very reasons we've been talking about. This, this won't be good for business. So it's a business case, but it's actually on the right side of the issue. And the B team of business leaders in January 2015 in Davos, and I happened to be there because I, I was a special envoy, I had to go to Davos, not a place I like very much, I have to say, but um, um, they made a commitment to be net zero greenhouse gas emissions in their corporations and in their supply chains by 2050 and do it the climate justice way with just transition. That was the full commitment. And I remember Christiana Figueroa is being so pleased with this kind of leadership. Now my role, I'm not a businesswoman, my role is their conscience. I co-chair the Net Zero Committee and I'm always saying, what are you doing? What's the next step? What's the next step? And, trying to, and, and they are taking steps. They're not enough steps yet, but they're, you know, they're, they are holding each other to a kind of account. The whole of the We Mean Business, which is about 400 companies, have also committed to be net zero by 2050. And when I was you know, paying tribute to the United Kingdom, as is it the first G7 country to commit legislatively to be net zero by in, in zero carbon emissions by 2050. Every country in the world needs to do that now. That needs to be the first step for companies, or countries and companies, all of them. But not very many of them have done it. And even you know, um, the company, the countries. Um, what are the steps? Well, what exactly? Um, how is it going to be measured? Um, but at least we've begun to, uh, to move. Um, I, you know, I, I, when I was brought together um, um, as, as an elder by Nelson Mandela, he told us we have to bring hope. We have to show courage where there is despair. We have to bring hope, you know, um, so that uh, I don't want people to get frightened and feel that this is so big, there's nothing we can do about it. I think we need everybody. We, we need business. We need the investment companies. We need the money to switch from fossil fuel into clean energy so that we can power our world with clean energy and have a much better and healthier world. But we, we, you know, um, we do need all, all parts to play. Tessa, what do you think is going through the minds of these great captains of industry? Um, I think they're in survival mode, um, a lot of them. So, you know, they're just trying to cling to power. I mean, power doesn't surrender itself without a fight. I think we know that from history. So, you know, when it, the writing is on the wall, as Mary has said, some industry leaders have realised they are engaging in the sort of planning that they need to. But that is, I would say, you know, the B team is a model for the rest of the business world, but it's a minority yeah. still. So, yeah, for the most part, um, I think there is denialism or there is um, naked self-interest, frankly, at work. We've got time for one other question. Uh, hello there, thank you so much for your uh, very interesting, inspiring, but also challenging words today. Um, I would just add one little thing about, um, about how you can work locally. It's through the transition town movement. There's lots that can go on through that. Uh, but, but my question to you really is to say, um, uh, how would things change if we had green governments around the world? Yeah, that's what we need. And, and actually, um, I, I found the recent European Parliament elections quite encouraging um, because we saw you know, a far right, but not as much as we feared. You know, there had been a lot of apprehension about how dominant that was going to be, and it, it didn't turn out that way quite. You know, it's, it's worrying because we're in a bumpy time with populism, etc. But also, you know, for younger people in particular and for you know, those who were for a long time um, been green anyway, um, the, the resurgence. In Ireland, 
Um, it was terrific. You know, we saw the Green Party really take off. Um, in Germany, which is really important from a European point of view, the Green Party um, is doing very well. And it's quite clear that even since the elections, you know, the, the reinforcement of that is strong. Um, what, what I think Tessa and I both feel is um, we need uh, to see the, the curve change. You know, um, uh, we need to reduce by 45% by 2030, and carbon emissions went up last year. So, you know, that's, that's the task, and it's at every level. You're quite right. It's at local community level, it's at town level, it's, a, it's at every level we can think of. But it also is necessary to um, somehow have a broad movement, and I think it's beginning. Um, you know, I mean, I'm very interested in women's leadership and have been for a long time, and I have access to a lot of high-level, top-down women's leadership because I've been a former president, but I also have good links with bottom-up uh, women's leadership. And until recently, women leaders in Europe and in the United States didn't talk about climate change. They talked about Me Too, they talked about equal pay, they talked about harassment, they talked about health and education, and then climate would be mentioned without quite knowing how. And I think this recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been a stark wake-up call for women. And that's why you know, the byline of our podcast, that climate change is a man-made problem and requires a feminist solution, really resonates. And you know, man-made is generic. Um, it includes all of us. Uh, yes, men had more time and power to pollute, but we're all polluting. We're all doing the wrong thing. We need to change our habits, consume less, etc. And a feminist solution definitely includes men. And you know, the more the more men, the better. Um, but um, what we absolutely have to do, and uh, we have to keep making, uh, you know, doing it as much as possible, is the urgency. Time is of the urgency, and that's what the school children are doing. I mean, I just feel so grateful that the Fridays for Future is you know, taking off, and I feel a, a lot of empathy for the Extinction Rebellion, um, because it is that urgent. Um, I would just add that um, I think we would be in a significantly better place if there was Green government um, in many countries. But just speaking generically, not about the Green Party specifically, but I think we definitely need a government to, and governments that will lead us through an environmental transition, but it will also be a social transition. Um, and we definitely need um, governments that are sensitive to the considerable dislocation that's going to be caused by us moving at the speed and scale that we need to. And that is not a reason not to move at that speed and scale, but it means that we have to put social justice at the heart of this project as much as environmental justice. So I would say a green government um, and socially just governments as well. I think we can all agree on that, and I think that's kind of all the time we've got. So I'd like to thank. Yes. Do I have a moment? Would you, you, you can have the last word, Mary. It, 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 it's just I, I want to kind of fulfil my elder responsibility yes. to bring hope. So can I tell you a funny story? Okay. Did it, would it make the Archbishop Desmond of Tutu smile? That's the criteria. Well, it's about him. Okay. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, I was on a panel about. Oh, it must be about eight or nine years ago now, with Archbishop Tutu. We were there as elders in New York at a social good conference for young people. Um, you know, uh, a bigger audience than this of young people on their iPads, on their iPhones, creating a big social media buzz. And when Archbishop Tutu is in front of young people, he expresses his love, his belief, you know, you're great, you're wonderful, etc. And we were being moderated by an American journalist. And she said quite sharply, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? <laughs> and he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, oh no, dearie, and he called her dearie, oh no, dearie, he said, I'm not an optimist, I'm a prisoner of hope. <laughs> and you know, I, I remember those words, I, they struck me at the time and I remember them and, and they, I've lived with them because we have to be prisoners of hope because hope brings energy. Uh, I can and could talk about climate, and so could Tessa, in a way that would frighten the living daylights out of you, because it's like that. It's possible to frighten the living daylights out of everybody. 
because it is so serious. But what does that do? You all shrug and say, oh, well, we're doomed, so what can we do? Whereas what we need is to recognize that we have this window that we're fortunate enough to have of time to do something about it. And that time is to create the political will, despite the fact that politicians have such short-term horizons and aren't waking up quickly enough. If they get the resistance, which children have started, young people have started, women's leadership is coming to the table, we have business on our side, we have investment, we have, it's, it's still not nearly enough, and we need to move fast, but we need to do it as prisoners of hope, with hope and determination, and, um, you know, um, it's all about the future of our species, for goodness sake. It's all about our children and grandchildren. I have six grandchildren. The eldest is 15. They'll be in their 30s and 40s in 2050. They'll share the world with 9 billion people. What kind of world? What, are we, you know, what, what is it that we have to do to reduce by 45% our carbon emissions by 2030 in 11 years' time? We have to be prisoners of hope, but we have to be determined, and we have to work at it. <laughs> Not right.